Hey, everybody. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Looks like everyone's connecting to the webinar and we'll get started in just a moment. Okay. Um, just so everyone knows before we get started, we'll, I'll use the chat feature to post any kind of links or things you might want to bookmark for later. And we'll use the Q&A once we get started for you to post questions that you have for our special guests. Um, it looks like everyone has connected so we can get started. Um, hi everyone, uh, welcome to the Q&A uh, with um, Associate Professor of Sustainability Studies, David Taylor. My name is Amanda Mills. I'm the Assistant Director of Admissions and um, happy to have you joining us. We will have a short presentation for you, but most of our time is going to be spent on question and answer. Uh, again, post in the Q&A anytime. And while we won't specifically be discussing our general admission requirements, if you have a couple general admission requirements, uh, Brian from the admissions office is here, so behind the scenes can answer some of those for you. Um, and I'll also post in the chat some opportunities we have for virtual information sessions and on-campus visits if you decide to visit us or want a little more admissions process information. And the session today is being recorded and will be available to watch on our YouTube page in uh, toward the end of the week. Um, so I'll also post the link for you for that so you can uh, bookmark that for later as well. Um, but now let's dive right into the main subject. Uh, David Taylor, it's all yours. Hi, everybody. How are you? Uh, thanks for uh, coming to the uh, talk this evening. So um, I'm Dr. David Taylor. Uh, I'm an associate professor in sustainability studies. Uh, I'm actually within this area of sustainability studies major. Uh, our faculty director is uh, Dr. Sharon Pachran. And uh, within this major, we actually have four different kinds of uh, sort of focuses, really, really environmental design and policy is a different one, but really thinking about uh, ecology and human population, economics and policy, and then my field, which is environmental humanities, to think about this as different tracks within the sustainability studies major. Um, one of the things that uh, is the most common question I get from people both in and outside of a university is, what is sustainability studies? Um, I try to remind them to think of it this way. Um, you know, it, these days during uh, what we see is the impact of climate change, and it's, uh, you know, in, uh, it's sort of the way it's making us rethink uh, our, our ways of getting by, the costs of things, sort of resiliency after major storms, or like even from my home state in the last week, uh, fires. Um, that uh, part of what we need to build is a resilient community, a resilient uh, uh, sort of work and livelihood. Sustainability studies is really about this, the skills needing to think about all of these issues as it relates to multiple parts of it, environmental, social, political, economic, and ethical. In other words, thinking that, yes, we need good science to understand what to do in relation to some of these issues, but sustainability study tri uh, studies tries to understand that all of these are connected, that we can't do just the science without understanding the political and the social, and maybe that we need to understand a little bit more about some of the policy issues to better understand, to think about how to engage people. Um, so one of the things that uh, we really focus on is this idea that you as a student need multiple skills in a sort of uh, transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary way with a focus on one thing by the time you graduate, whether this is policy, uh, ecology and human population or humanities. Um, real quickly, I try to remind people of this. If you're from the state of New York, uh, recently the state of New York passed what's called the Climate Protection Act. And this means that um, it is by mandate that by 2030, all of the state of New York, Manhattan to Long Island to Buffalo to you name it, 
we have to reduce our greenhouse gases by 50%. And by 2050, we're supposed to have reduced our greenhouse gas emissions by 100%, that we should have a zero greenhouse gas emissions uh, for the state. Now, let's be honest, we're not going to make that. There's there, there, there's just not, it's not feasible. However, the mandate is there. And so one of the things I've been reminding my students is to imagine what's going to be required and uh, of businesses and agencies and nonprofits. They're going to need people who can help guide them toward these mandates. So it's an opportune time to be thinking about the kinds of things you would learn in sustainability studies that would help you find employment after graduation. So if we could go forward. Um, one of the tracks within sustainability studies is so societies, economics, and governance. Um, this is advised by Dr. Adam Charbonneau. Uh, it's really, again, focused on the political, economic, and social systems, sort of looking at these historical roots and then thinking about and engaging people in sort of how do we change these uh, in, uh, you know, sort of get the community involved in dealing with these issues around, say, growth or change or coastal resiliency. Um, so this is where, if you look at this, it really, like he has two slides here. One of them is, is by, at Port Jeff, um, just uh, a little east of our campus. And the one above it is Port Jeff Station, which is only about three miles away from the picture you see here at the coast. And one of the things he's looking at is some of the changes that are going on in Port Jeff Station, which is a more economically and socially challenged area than the, the uh, coast, because the coast, of course, is always you know, going to draw people with more money, but you see the challenges only two or three miles away. So this is where, when you think about this track, it really prepares you for thinking about working within agencies and law, and especially looking at how these relate to uh, communities and how these communities can respond uh, in this way. Uh, if you could go forward. Um, the other track is advised by Dr. Pachran. Uh, This is uh, looking at here, the area you see is called the Worm Lab. It's an interdisciplinary track sort of focused on the intersection between humans and natural environments. Um, what she really does is she has her students really do a lot in looking at how to develop research projects in the lab that relate to sort of ecotoxicology or other issues around uh, soil health, or even looking at, at times, I know she's worked with groups on our campus about bird strikes. And they will go around and work with different groups and at places and buildings along our campus and sort of look at and think about ways of counting which are the buildings and especially the windows that are most dangerous, and then try to have those mitigated by different sort of ways of thinking about how to help those uh, have, how to help those buildings uh, improve. And this is the one where if you look at it, many of her students go on to graduate studies, especially um, in things like, uh, again, I, I know of a number of students who've gone on in ecotoxicology. Sometimes they go on into other forms of environmental science. Uh, and I know a few of the students along with mine have gone into uh, conservation management. If you could go forward. Uh, this is environmental humanities. Uh, this is the one that I advise is I uh, remind people I'm um, I have a PhD in English uh, in a school of science, but uh, much of my background and my work has always been around environmental sciences and so I collaborate and I do work with them. The students who come into the environmental humanities track, they're really focused on these ideas of how can we bring writing, communication, arts, ethics, into a way that we can uh, sort of bring this into the discussion about sustainability and the environment. Um, I remind them all of the time that every one of my students who graduates inevitably finds a job uh, primarily around issues of communication, uh, sometimes in forms of outreach. A few of my students go on to do um, gra graduate degrees, especially masters uh, in sustainability studies. Um, but this is sort of looking at it, thinking about, you know, when we're, I was saying earlier, we think about sustainability studies as interdisciplinary. 
you can think of uh, these three different tracks as being one that's more about policy, sort of around economics. Dr. Pochran's, the uh, EHI, the, is focused a little bit more on the soil science and sort of human and, and sort of environment uh, kind of connection. And then uh, the environmental humanities being more about the social communication and arts. Um, I actually have these two pictures up here. One of them, that's a, a sassafras blossom, which should be coming out here in about another month and a half. Uh, and then uh, some of my students, two of my students um, actually co-edited a volume that came out last year of student nature, uh, of student writing and art about um, one of the woods that we have on our campus at Stony Brook. So if you could go forward. Um, one of the things that we do in sustainability studies is we really, really push our students to do independent research projects. Um, I currently am mentoring nine undergraduate students uh, on different art, uh, different uh, research projects. Five of them are doing a, a statewide project, and then uh, a couple of individual students and another uh, group that's working on a National Science Foundation grant. But one of the things that we try to do is we, we want our students to go do work, to try before they graduate to create a portfolio, to know what it's like to do independent research. Uh, three of my students did a, um, a, a GIS story map, uh, so a, a geographical information story map project looking at perceptions of the Hudson River. And uh, they collected over 900 different responses to their survey from the uh, headwaters to the Hudson down by in Manhattan, uh, sort of looking at people's perceptions of the health of the river and then actually sort of discussing it in light of the actual health of the river. And this was one of those that ended up being a really important kind of project. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Schockman, who is down here holding the uh, mirror uh, in front of the uh, solar panels, she is now finishing up her master's in sustainability and economics. Uh, as a graduate student uh, in a master's program, uh, but she worked with some of the uh, the students in a statewide group that worked toward uh, getting the governor to sign off on the uh, Climate Protection Act. And then I had two students up here work on a documentary film about uh, Lee Koppelman, who was the most important uh, planner uh, for Suffolk County um, for almost 50 years. And he really shaped the East End of Long Island. And we were able to do a documentary about his life and work uh, about a year before he passed away. So it was a really important documentary to put together. So if you could go forward. Um, one of the things in addition to independent research, I say to students all the time, do an internship. Um, this is so important for your age group. It's different than when I was young. When I was young, if you had good grades, and you were a good student, uh, you set yourself apart from others. Nowadays, that's not the case. Every student has good grades. Every student, you know, uh, has, and will get nice letters, I think, from a professor or two if, they're, if they've had good grades. The way you begin to distinguish yourself as a student when you want to start trying to look for jobs is you've done an internship and you've done an independent research project. That makes you a very different kind of candidate. And especially, too, if you look at, and by the way, this is just some of the places our students have interned. Uh, more likely, it would be about double this of the different places our students go to. Uh, I'm already working with uh, about 10 students finding internships this summer. Um, this is so important. This, I'm saying this to you as uh, the old geezer faculty person talking to you about your career. Get an internship and get them, honestly, at, as early as after your sophomore year. I can't, it's so important because you uh, you build these relationships that in the end help you find employment. You learn the things you like and the things you don't like, which are very different than maybe some of the things you learn in your classrooms. So as I always try to say to students, this is so important. Get out there, meet people, go do work, see what it's like. And then it'll help you in thinking about what do you want to do after you graduate in terms of going into work, going straight to graduate school? It'll help you understand the things you like and don't. Okay, we could go forward again. 
Um, by the way, this, I took this picture in Virginia about a year ago. It is a uh, a butterfly that's actually been renamed. It used to be a, called a red spotted purple. And now a little bit because of hybridization, uh, it's actually called a red spotted admiral. And these guys just have the most beautiful color. When they close their wings, that's when you see the red spots on the bottom. Um, one of the things I want you to do uh, is if you have any questions about these uh, after the Zoom, please reach out to uh, Dr. Charbonneau, Dr. Pachrin, or myself. We're always really responsive in our emails. We really care about our students' success. And we also really want to talk to you about our programs. Um, every one of these people on this list are excellent, excellent folks in reaching out, um, you know, and, and, and responding to you. Um, real quickly, I wanted to see if you, uh, if Adrian could go talk a little bit about his experience uh, as a, a student in sustainability studies. Sorry about that. Um, That's okay. Uh, so yeah, um, basically, at least when it comes to my classes and the classes I have taken, I've taken a few of um, Dr. Pogrom and Professor Charbonneau. Um, I think they're great professors. I've enjoyed thoroughly their classes. Um, also to introduce myself, sorry, a more improper introduction. I am a current senior and uh, my current major is Ecosystems and Human Impact. So technically under uh, Dr. Pakram's uh, type of field. Um, uh, technically my major doesn't exist at Stony Brook anymore per se, cause it's under um, more of a broader sustainability uh, group, but I still will finish with that degree. So that's very exciting. Um, when it comes to the classes, again, a lot of it's um, research um, and just, you know, doing all that type of stuff. Um, for example, uh, one of the classes is sustainability for one with, um, Professor Charbonneau, uh, I had it last semester, and what we did was we created a whole report on Port Jefferson and all that. So I was part in making that whole report for the whole Port Jefferson revitalization, as well as my peers. Uh, we basically created um, we basically saw how the revitalization negatively impacted the environment and just the community around there, not just as like organisms living there, but just the communities as well and how it affects them. Um, it was really interesting. We all got to write our piece about what we thought was going on in that class. Um, and eventually the report, um, Professor Charbonneau has the report. So um, it's really long and extensive, but we worked hard on it. And it's, um, it was really exciting. It was really fun, actually. Um, I have another class with him. I actually had a class with him today, um, Sustainability 301. Um, and again, it's really just fun being in that class, um, even then in uh, Professor Pockwam's class in the mornings was really fun because we got to learn about invasives and all that and just how ecosystems work and it was really, really fun. Adrian, um, where did you go to high school? Um, I went to high school. In, my high school is called A. Philip Randolph Campus High School. It's in Harlem. It's literally right next to City College in New York City. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was a school in Harlem. I went there all four years. It was really fun. I was originally under medicine, actually, because uh, my school had uh, engineering, medicine, and all that. So I went for medicine, and now I'm in sustainability, but I actually really do enjoy it a lot. So so when you were applying to college, now that you're a senior and you look back, you you was this even kind of on your mind at all as something you might end up pursuing? Yes and no. Um, surprisingly, when I was in high school, I did a few internships at Wave Hill. I did forest restoration. I did invasive species. I did GIS mapping and all that. It was really fun. So I kind of had like experience in the field. Again, I was pre-med for a while and wanted to do that for a while up until I guess my freshman year of going to Stony Brook. Um, and then I was just like, it doesn't really like fit my style. And keep in mind, I was I came into Stony Brook with my ecosystems and human impact major already from the get go, but I wasn't really planning on continuing it. I wanted to like switch. I did switch for a while, but then eventually I took the classes, the sustainability classes with Dr. Pakram and Professor Charbonneau, and I really liked them. So I think I I ended up unintentionally with the the major I have now, but I don't have any complaints about it. Excellent. Um. 
were there any things like when you think about your high school compared to, you know, most high schools don't have 18,000 undergraduate students yeah. like Stony Brook. So, um, but within even the ecosystems and human impact and within SOMAS, it's a much smaller community. Mm -hmm. Did you find that that was kind of a more of a easy transition into a smaller community at a large institution? Um. Definitely, especially because um, at least when it came to my freshman and sophomore year at Stony Brook, I was taking some of the general classes still, you know, the bios and the chems and all that. But once I got into like the sustainability like classes and all that, it was mostly like concentrated. I know most of my peers in the sustainability like major and all that. Um, and especially the professors, again, Dr. Popham and um, Professor Charbonneau. I feel like they're really great professors and they feel like they really know me well as a student and, you know, I'm clearly present in their classes. So um, for them to just like, not just give me like recognition, but just like acknowledge me as like a student in their class is very, very good. And it's also very like reassuring. It's like, oh, okay, I am in like the right field and I am with like the right people who I enjoy not just like the same field with, because we all have like general like niches and like specifics, but we can agree on like the general senses, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah, I think a lot of students who are, you know, kind of thinking about Stony Brook don't realize how close of a connection you can actually have with your peers and with your professors at a school the size of Stony Brook. It seems intimidating until you actually are on campus and start to have those experiences. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question in the Q&A about the, what um, you were talking about, um, mm -hmm. David, the New York State's environmental goals sure. <laughs> uh, and the kinds of jobs that companies might be, what, what kind of positions might people be looking for in the next few years as they start to need to meet those goals? Sure. So this is the one where one of the things you're beginning to see more and more of is a sustainability manager for different companies. Uh, what this means is, is they're looking at overall uh, what are the sort of uh, things that a company does that um, you would have the state look at for whether it's emissions, inefficiencies, uh, some kind of impact on the environment. And a sustainability manager isn't the person that necessarily has to be able to do you know, the toxicology to figure out what this is or an atmospheric chemist to understand what's being emitted per se, but rather the sustainability manager is the one who needs that sort of broad sense of knowledge and understanding and then understand the cost and the sort of cost benefit analysis as it relates to how to make this sort of changes so that the company can afford to do it. So there's a number of different ways then. One of these is a broader sense of the sustainability manager, right? But you're beginning to see this too, where um, especially in the economic side of it, you're seeing people begin to really think carefully about how can we make our company resilient during a time of climate change? And this is the kind of thing where um, I spent part of today talking uh, with other faculty about the role of economics uh, and sustainability that we often think of, you know, as business as being sort of anti-environment. And that is not the case in the future. In the future, it's going to be these companies that are sort of going to address, address how to stay profitable and to be uh, environmentally resilient. Those are going to be the people moving forward. But when you think about this in another way, right, think about this in terms of like, I'm sure uh, Adrian would agree, if you look at what was being taught in terms of policy, governance, uh, community relations, these are multiple jobs that you can see that um, all of these companies need somebody who's generally informed about sustainability, meaning a broad understanding of what this means, and then has skills that are particularly related to one aspect. So for example, some of my students who graduated in the humanities uh, one of my students is now is running the invasive species side of the Massachusetts uh, Department of Conservation. And again, it's because she understands the science that needs to be there. But part of what they're doing is they needed to really have somebody who was very good at communication and outreach 
to help get out the message about these invasive species. This is the kind of thing then where I would say, I think the way to think about this is be thinking about what your passion is. What is your interest? What is it that really makes you want to get up and learn more and work harder? And then be thinking about how that works within something like sustainability studies, where it's this sort of broad possibility. And we want you to learn sort of these interdisciplinary skills, but then we want you to really become stronger in one part of it. And if that's policy, great. If that's uh, sort of uh, environment and human impact, that's great. And if it's, you know, outreach communication and arts even, that's great, right? So our idea is, is that the more you can see what your passion is in sustainability, the more you're going to find that there's work out there within that, whether it's in a company or whether it's an agency or whether it's a nonprofit. Thank you. I had a, a question, and this is, um, I think, something we probably have quite a few students who grapple with. Um, if you are, you know, not right out of high school and you're coming to right. Stony Brook to pursue a degree, but you might be working full time and you're trying to kind of factor in, all right, I have classwork requirements. How do I how do I fit in an internship is, you know, what's the feasibility of that? Or is there opportunities for like part-time or on-campus research and internships that might fit for someone who doesn't have unlimited, you know, free time, quote unquote? Sure. I think you actually partly answered it. If I had a student and, and I've had a student or two uh, do this, that um, they weren't, they they were non-traditional students. They had full-time jobs. One of my students actually had two children. And um, my thought was rather than try to work, you know, and put in, force in an internship that is requiring 30 hours a week, why not do independent research projects? And part of then my independent research projects is to have them actually uh, as part of the research, work with these different groups that they're really interested to know more about. That's part of the research. Uh, I'm doing an independent research project with a student right now who wants to, she and her partner want to move to Chicago. And what we've been doing for the first seven weeks of the semester is looking at every government agency, nonprofit, uh, other groups that are interested in some of the topics that she is. And again, keep in mind, she's now got over 80 different groups that she's going to be work, uh, talking to. And what we're doing is, is when she gets back from spring break after next week, is that we're then going to start to limit this down and she's going to develop different kinds of forms of communication with these groups and start thinking about her skills, developing a portfolio so that she understands the job opportunities that are there. So in some ways, it's like doing an internship as an independent research project because I want her to be successful. I want her to be able to find, uh, you know, the possibility of employment in a new place like Chicago. Um, and it seemed to be the better answer. There are some internships that don't require as much time in person. Some of them can be done online. There are others that just don't require as many hours. So I think one of the things you would find is that your faculty uh, advisor would work with you to find a solution to this question. It shouldn't be a barrier for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question about, and I mean, this isn't exactly what Stony Brook has, but I'm guessing there might be some relation to what we're talking about, but what other majors in, or minors would be recommended if, for, to go into a career like industrial ecology or to become an industrial ecologist? Does that kind of tie in at all to any of the ecosystems and human impact maybe? Yeah, I, I would actually say it's probably going to be one of those where you're in this intersection of deciding uh, that you're going to do ecosystems and human impact probably. Uh, you might be doing sustainability studies on economics and policy, but I would also probably suggest then you do another, uh, you either do a double major or a minor in something like either business or logistics 
or some other one. And this is where like, I would want to sit down with the student and sort of listen to what the student wants. But it's one of those, I, um, I really spend a lot of time with my students um, trying to see if it's possible for them to double major. Uh, if at all possible, I really encourage it because I think the more diverse you are these days graduating, and if you have multiple skill sets, and especially if you can find creative connections between these multiple skill sets, the more you're sort of uh, set up to be able to move into something like industrial ecology. Um, but do keep in mind, one of my one of my former students is in charge of a group called the Center for, uh, what is it, the uh, Center for Wildlife and Habitat. And this group, it's a, it's a big national group. They work with big industry, big industry. And their goal is to help these industries make their physical uh, spaces more environmentally friendly. And they actually have people come in who are ecologists and habitat specialists and have them work with their grounds, with their buildings, and they actually go through a certification process so that uh, by the end, their, their companies are actually, and the places, the physical places and uh, the areas are actually more environmentally friendly. They're more uh, diverse in terms of habitat, and they're actually better for sort of, especially around migratory species like birds. Um, and this is a huge deal. Um, and and uh, my student is now the events manager for this national group. And they, they do great work. So it's the one, though, where she had kind of positioned herself in having a double major in sustainability studies, environmental humanities, and a, a, another degree in business. So she her, her double major really helped her in finding that job. And Adrian, um, it, when you, you know, you're taking classes at Stony Brook, you have your major you have the Stony Brook core curriculum or the Stony Brook curriculum SBCs, and then you have electives. Have you taken any kind of group of electives or used your electives creatively at all to explore other academic interests? Um, definitely a few. Um, I definitely had to take um, a physics course for a class I'm going to hopefully take next semester. I forget what exactly the class it is, but I had to take a specific like biophysics course that I needed for one of the classes that I wanted to take, but that definitely helped a little bit. Um, I also took a, an astronomy course, I think, sophomore year. It was actually really interesting. It really helped me like just branch out into like just other interests because uh, at the time, anything else couldn't really fit into my schedule. So I was like, you know what, let me just take this course just to just get a credit, maybe boost up my grade a little bit just so I can have like something there. But overall, again, even then, it's, just, it's not that hard to like try to explore into classes because you never know what you might find. Obviously, you know, read your reviews, you know, see how your professors are because, you know, you never know what you might get, but, you know, be cautious. And um, so we had a question about the variety of courses you might take in the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences or in a major, but also if you're able to sp explore other areas like art. And um, I think Stony Brook does a really good job because we're a liberal arts curriculum. Um, you know, you have a subset of courses that are required for your major. You have usually plenty of room, especially with the sustainability studies major, as David said, to double major or to add a few minors and, you know, explore a lot of different areas. And Stony Brook has, I think we're up to 80 minors. <laughs> so, I mean, from language and cultural studies to the arts, music, um, to additional, you know, science related or even SOMA specific areas, you would have definitely enough time in a four year degree to do that as a sustainability studies major um, in any of the tracks. So I think that flexibility is really nice, especially because we are a research institution and you kind of think, wow, I'm gonna have all these requirements, but you, you have flexibility. Um, and uh, Brian, who's actually here from the admissions office, also did his sustainability studies major with the fast track MBA program. So you have lots of opportunities, both at the undergraduate and graduate level. If you put in the work, <laughs> 
you know, it is it is work. Um, David, anything to add about, you know, students you've worked with who are taking other majors or minors or just classes as electives? Sure. Um, you know, I, I have uh, I worked with a student who was a marine vertebrate uh, major a couple of years ago, but she was also wanting to do something in journalism and outreach. And I got her an internship with the South Fork Museum on with the shark research team. So she did all of their media, all their social media and outreach. And then we actually created uh, a sort of uh, survey project so that she could see the efficacy of her work and come to find out it actually was, it really improved sort of public knowledge about sharks. Uh, and she also got to get on the boat to go out with the research team and tag sharks for a day. So um, to me, it's the one where I really encourage my students to be more diverse. I have students I work with who are visual artists. I have students I work with who are far more on, you know, the sort of, uh, I, I have, I had a student who was an atmospheric major who um, was also a environmental humanities major. And actually she was one of the two people on the documentary film. So it's the one that I, I feel like in SOMAS and especially in sustainability, um, diversity is is sort of key and it's really encouraged. Um, I think, you know, depending like if somebody were going to try to be a, an engineering double major in something, that's a challenging one because of the engineering degree. Um, but I actually did have I did have a a, a engineering student who was also an environmental humanities minor. And uh, we still stay in touch. She's doing her PhD right now uh, and in engineering. And yeah, she actually, we stay in touch about her environmental humanities work. I would really encourage you, this is our job as advisors uh, to work with you, to find a plan that fits uh, your your interests and and your passions. Because, you know, that's what's going to carry you forward into a career that's going to make you happy is, you know, that you come to the university, you study what, yes, we want you to study to make sure that, you know, you're, you're a bachelor's of whatever. But I also think it's our job to help you sort of find your own interests and to develop something that you can imagine for the, that you want to do for the rest of your life. So that it's not just a job, it's more of a vocation. Yes. Um, Someone had uh, submitted a question about how the field of sustainability has kind of evolved, but I don't know when they mean from. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> if they mean just at Stony Brook, but I guess. Well, in no, general... this is an interesting question. Um, so, actually, again, even the term sustainability is a relatively new term. It really hasn't been used um, often until probably the late 80s and early 90s. This really came about uh, primarily through studies of looking at population, uh, looking at issues of, especially even back then, uh, the, the initial sort of discussion about the impacts of climate change. And then being, you know, like even for me, from being uh, sort of an environmentally kind of conscious person and being a bit of an activist in the 80s, we didn't think of it in terms of sustainability. We thought about saving a particular piece of land or we started thought about it as, you know, getting a particular animal on the Endangered Species Act. But it was really when people started thinking at a more global scale, we began to ask these broader questions of, well, we don't want to eradicate humans. What we want is a sustainable society, a society that would live and work well with the environment that we have. And that we would do this in a way that's sustainable for us and for, and sustainable for other life, right? And so when you look at it, actually, it's in the mid-90s and in the early 2000s, you start seeing the word sustainability move into the international uh, sort of uh, vocabulary of thinking about development, of thinking about um economics and thinking about some notion then of how we work together. Look back at the history of the UN, look at, at this where you know you start seeing people start talking about what's called the Sustainability Development Index, which is World Wildlife Fund and Environmental Defense Fund, 
use these terms to think about what is the long-term projection of a, of a nation's uh, efforts towards sustainability? Are they managing the population that they have? Are they doing this in a sort of way that is economically feasible? And are they not drawing upon uh, their natural resources in a way that's that's sort of you know bringing this down? Um, as far as the when you start looking nationally at programs and sustainability, it's really a little bit after two thousand. Even Stony Brook was around this time where they were developing this initially uh, at the Southampton campus. And then uh, really around 2010, 2012, they moved the, the, the uh, program to main campus uh, where it is now. And um, that's the one where, you know, even uh, I've been here now 10 years. I came up in 2014. It's the one where our program has continued to grow. Uh, there are going to be sustainability programs at every major institution, always connected with environmental science. Uh, and because it's sustainability, connected across policy, economics, uh, design, urban design and planning, uh, environmental humanities, and uh, environmental science and ecosystems and human impact and ecotoxicology. And those are the programs that I would encourage you to look at and go, oh, this is kind of the idea. It can't just be one part of it. It can't just only be policy. It has to be sustainability with policy as a part of it that is also then about uh, outreach and communication that is also about good science. So when you look at it, it's, it's a relatively new discussion in some ways. Uh, maybe that's just because I'm old. I think of it as a new discussion. But I, I I think that it's the one where you're going to see these programs grow nationally uh, in light of all the issues we're faced with climate change and that's going to happen throughout uh, your lives as young people. There are going to be more and more programs because there are going to be more and more jobs. That's just the bottom line. Yes. Um, and if you're joining us and you're you know, deciding whether to come to Stony Brook or apply to Stony Brook in the future, I think that does, you know, have kind of a positive ring to it when you think that there will be opportunities, um, not just in terms of careers, but in terms of research and internships, because all along the way, you're going to need to get involved in that. And, and that brings me to the question we have from uh, John, who is asking, as a high school student who's studying uh, microplastics for a research project, um, he's wondering if the study of sustainability, if we have any courses or research or any faculty or maybe students or grad students kind of focused on microplastics specifically. Um, Dr. Pochran's lab is actually starting to take this up. She's looked at everything from uh, rubber leachate, uh, from uh, the crumb rubber used in like playgrounds uh, and its impact. But I know she actually had a conversation with uh, some of the uh, some of the folks uh, with the city of New York the other day about uh, microplastics and especially about the, the, their conversation was, you know, the uh, detergent uh, little pods, the plastic film that they use, uh, they were wondering whether or not these have an impact on the environment. And so uh, she, Dr. Pochran had a conversation with them about this topic. So yes, there there is a conversation about this. There's also, uh, there's a class in marine pollution uh, there And this is a topic, I, I'm actually on a waste management committee that we're actually talking about this too. Uh, this is more of a Long Island wide discussion that we're having about microplastics. Um, it is going to be a conversation and there would be the possibility for research in that field if you came to Stony Brook. Yes, and congratulations on doing research in high school. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. wonderful. Um, <laughs> we... Um, we have a we had a question that was pre-submitted about, sure. um, you know, it, they said they are aware of a lot of the opportunities kind of on campus, but are there opportunities either through study abroad or off campus connections that, you know, faculty or the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences have? Sure. So, um, one, uh, we have a number of study abroad opportunities in uh, SOMAS, 
Uh, Dr. Ryder uh, offers programs to Ireland, uh, Europe. We uh, She's also increased that now to include Tanzania. Uh, one of our faculty in marine sciences, uh, Dr. Loiza, is from Tanzania. And so he goes on that trip. Um, we have a, a marine trip in the winter that goes to Jamaica. Um, I've led a number of trips because a lot of my research is in Cuba. Um, I'm probably going to lead a trip this next winter uh, to Cuba on ecotourism and sustainability in Cuba. Uh, and so, yeah, there are a number of, of uh, study abroad in SOMAS, but also, you know, we have a whole study abroad office at Stony Brook. Um, a lot of our students end up going to Madagascar with uh, Dr. Wright, uh, which is a phenomenal program. And um, we, we really do encourage study abroad. Uh, as for the other question, you know, if you look at most of uh, the faculty in especially sustainability and SOMAS, we all have um, different relations to the community. Um, again, and differing, you know, like I'm not going to tell people much about, you know, marine fisheries, but I can tell you the people in marine fisheries and SOMAS have connections to all of the New York fisheries programs in Cornell and otherwise. Um, it's the one where, you know, part of our job as faculty is to do our research, to teach our courses, but it's also to be a part of the sort of community, uh, and especially around these questions of environmental responsibility and sustainability. So, yes, we're all we all have long and deep connections um, to our communities. It, it's just one. And we want our students to be out there. Right. So. We don't have any more questions, but I wanted to give each of you an opportunity to maybe say a couple final words, maybe some words of encouragement to get through the rest of high school, senior year for those that are graduating um, and those that are rising seniors on, you know, <laughs> luck for the application cycle and process next year because we have a, a nice uh, mix of guests joining us. Adrian, go ahead. You're, you're closer to that than I was. Than I am. <laughs> from Adrian, from, from your experience of remembering back through the application process, any words of wisdom on kind of getting through senior year and applying to colleges without being too stressed? <laughs> um, a little bit. Um, not gonna lie, I remember um at least when it came to my college applications, I didn't save it till last minute, but when at least when it came to the essay, I kind of saved until last minute because I just didn't know what I wanted to write. Um, at the end, I did realize what I wanted to write because I did do those internships in high school and stuff like that. So I would want. So what I would want to say is that basically, just like, not just be yourself, but just like tell your passions. You know, tell it how it is. Just what really interests you. Like, if you really like are passionate about something or if you know you're really focused or want to learn about something or even if it's just like you don't know about anything if you don't know about like the specifics yet but you still want to learn you know just talk about that like I'm passionate about this and I want to learn more about this and this and that so I guess just being honest and just giving your ambitions and all that is really important okay um so I oh, often tell did. people this that I know I'm a little bit old I'm starting to get to be where I realize that more and more. But um, I was the first person in my family to go to college. Um, my grandparents never got past sixth grade. And my not my dad didn't finish high school till he was 20 because he had to work in the fields in the fall. And my mom never finished high school. She got a GED. Um, and so it was important for my parents to go to college, uh, that I go to college. And the reason they thought uh, was that, you know, I would be offered this sort of great life that they didn't have. I wouldn't have to work, you know, in the same way that they did. Um, I think the thing that sh that I've looked back at, and I think what I value so much about thinking about that time when I decided to go to college and I was thinking about this, college gave me a chance to follow what I care about and to constantly be kind of uh, intellectually curious and to be able to build a career around it. And 
it's the one where that gift from my parents to help me, you know, pay for school and to go through all of this, I didn't realize enough at 18 how exciting it is to be around this chance to create what you imagine you want to do and and stay passionate about for the rest of your life, like your working life, that it's this sort of interesting moment. So I, I look back at it and I think, you know, the, it's I, I, I always say it's like it's so exciting for me to meet young people because it reminds me of that feeling that I had that I still live in which is there's so much possibility to imagine and create what you might want in your work life and in your personal life. And that the more you can sort of stay focused on that and then look at how either sustainability or Stony Brook or, uh, or an institution can help you fulfill that. That's where I would say to, to put your energy. And that's when I would say when it gets difficult and scary or boring or any of those, Go back to that moment that you realize there's something that you really, really deeply care about that makes you want to get up early and work at it, that that's the one thing to follow because that it will it will lead you to really amazing places. That's great. Well, I'll give one small piece of advice, and that is email management. <laughs> <laughs> because you don't want to let it go. <laughs> you want to stay on top of it, especially when you're applying to colleges. It, it can also often be helpful to have a separate college email address that you only use for college material because you could theoretically be looking at dozens of different schools and then narrow it down to you know the schools you're applying to but they're never going to stop emailing you so um, email management during the application process will save you lots of stress trying to find login information in the future so um, I know it sounds silly when you're just starting out but trust me it makes a big difference um, well, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Thank you so much to David and Adrian for your time and your wisdom. Uh, we hope to see all of our guests on campus as sea wolves in the future. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Brian. Bye, Adrian.